Hi, I'm Paul. And I'm Erin, and we're the hosts of Lifetime Sentence. Do you roll your eyes when you see the words Lifetime Presents? Or maybe like me, you love trashy TV movies, but cringe when you see the words based on a true story. Have you ever wondered what they got wrong? Or maybe what they got right? Well, we've got you covered. Every week I watch a Lifetime original movie based on a true crime and then tell you all about it. And then I tell you the true story of what really happened. From high-profile cases like Gypsy Rose Blanchard and Jody Arias to crimes you may never have heard of, like the tale of the Sinister Minister. Lifetime has covered them all, and so will we. Because sometimes the truth really is stranger than fiction. Listen to Lifetime Sentence on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, or on your favorite podcast app. About an hour ago, fell somewhere by the table, or maybe the floor. Hey, we're the girls from the Despair and Distress podcast. We sit around drinking, talking about things that creep us out. That is, if we can get past our wildly inappropriate banter. We may not have our facts in order, but we sure have fun trying. <laughs> so, if you're interested in hearing about things you wish you hadn't, then maybe swing by iTunes, Podbean, etc., and give your earbuds a nice little tickle with our podcast. But be warned, if you came here for true facts, you're going to be out of luck. You can also find us on Twitter at beer underscore dis. Or the Twitter. Stay from Evil Minds podcast. On the podcast, I'll be covering some of the most horrendous crimes ever committed. Some of them you may have heard of, others you won't, but all of them are true. So come and join me every Wednesday as we look at some of the most evil minds that have existed. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or just about anywhere where you get your podcasts from. I hope to speak to you soon. Ladies and gentlemen, this podcast, truly one of the most unusual ever recorded, contains dribble, slang, and frank discussion of subject matter which under no circumstances should be heard by small children, persons with a heart condition, or anyone who is upset easily. If you are such a person, or if you are the parent of a very small child in the room, we urge you to switch off your streaming device now. Hi, Jen. Hey, Cam. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing great. Happy Mother's Day. Right back at you. And happy belated Mother's Day to all the other mother listeners out there. And for mommies. And for and for anybody, actually. Yeah, for anybody. Because <laughs> to be truthful, it's not really a Mother's Day. Not it's, if you're a mom. No. Let's be honest. Mm-mm. You still work. For you still instance, do everything. What are you doing today? I am actually going out to visit my mother. But you are going to do what when you're there? Uh, Help her pack up and move. Yep. Yeah. Woo. That's what I wanted to do. And what are you? I am making dinner for my mother. Oh, that's awesome. (laughs) Did you get anything special for Mother's Day? Oh, my gosh. I did. I got diamonds and I got a maid and I got a cook. Nope. And then I woke up. (laughs) Yeah. No. No. My husband wished me a happy Mother's Day and my kids grunted at me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Uh, Yeah. It's wonderful being it a is, mom, isn't it? it? It's, a, it's just, they're just blessings, I tell you. <laughs> All right. Blessings, well, I love them so blessings. much. <laughs> Enough chit chat. I got a long case for you. I, I've this heard is it's actually, very long. this is going to be a two parter. Right? And I had a difficult time putting this together. I really did. It's it's something. It's crazy. And it's from here in St. Louis. They usually are. It happened in 1986. There wasn't a lot of info on the internet about this. So my only resources was a book 
that was written by a local woman that worked at the newsroom and newspaper articles. Normally, I try to get transcripts from court cases, Mm -hmm. but due to certain witnesses, I believe, it's all under wraps. Oh. Because the witnesses, they were told that their identities would be kept secret because of who they are. Uh, Oh. So this kind of deals with... People maybe. A little St. Louis famous? A little high society St. Louis famous. I like. Okay. Mm, So St. Louis has a weird social society kind of standing, social standings, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Let me give you a little bit background of St. Louis. When I talk about St. Louis, I'm including the greater St. Louis area, which includes St. Louis City and St. Louis County, which together is an area of almost 575 square miles. So St. Louis is a very conservative city. Phyllis Shafley, Mm -hmm. anyone, right? The actual metropolitan area is very liberal, but the further west you drive, the more conservative Mm -hmm. and wealthier you get. So St. Louis's do love their culture. We have at least seven art museums, tons of performing art venues, amazing amount of kids' places to go and see and do, like the Science Center, the City Museum, all that kind of fun Mm. stuff. And most of it all is free, right? Mm -hmm. Or there's hardly any charges. Mm -hmm. There's also beer. There's beer. beer everywhere you go, beer. So the St. Louis area has a lot of upper middle class areas surrounding the few top 1% people. So we have three of the top wealthiest suburbs in the United States. I did not know that. Yes. We have Ledoux. Mm -hmm. That is number 51. And there's Ledoux, who's very wealthy. And then the rest of us live in Ledont. Remember? Frontenac area is 86. And Town and Country is 93. The majority of the wealthiest people in St. Louis come from old money, pretty much because they have been here for generations upon generations. Families like Anheuser-Busch, mm-hmm. the McDonald's for McDonald Douglas, mm-hmm. the Danforths were Ralston Perina, and the Pulitzers, Pulitzer Prize, oh. right? From St. Louis, then the Pulitzers moved to New York. Um, we have a large number of family-owned, privately held businesses that have been successful since St. Louis had first started, and most of the very wealthy people here believe that new money shines and old money doesn't. Hmm. That means they don't like to talk about their wealth Mm. at all. They like to fit in. They don't brag that they donate. They don't. They're not new money. They're not new money. (laughs) Exactly. They don't really care about the nouveau reach either. They find them vulgar and When you grow up like that, you don't know. It's bougie. Right. Here's another little fun thing about St. Louis. St. Louisans, the true St. Louisans that have been here forever, Camille and I are transplants. We're not from the St. Louis area. They like to define themselves where they went to school. St. Louis also has an u- unusually high proportion of students that attend private school. That's why I always thought it was more like classes. Where are you? Yes. Like, where, do you where do you come from? Right. Because you can sense, mm-hmm. you can tell people's position in society from where they went. And how much it costs. Like John Burroughs. John Burroughs, the for one year of eighth grade, I think it starts at seventh or eighth grade, it's like forty seven thousand dollars for high school, not college, high school. And that's where the very wealthy Mm -hmm. send their kids. Isn't that where John Ham went? I think it is. Now let's start this little story here, shall we? We shall. All right. So during the early mornings of May 6, 1986, the Baldwin Fire Department were dispatched to a house fire. By 6 a.m., the Major K Squad would be called to the scene to investigate a suicide. Now, Baldwin is one of those towns that is still included in St. Louis County, but it's located far west. It's usually very quiet, and it's considered one of the number one safest communities in Missouri. Per FBI data, There's hardly any violent crime in the area. And actually, the past 15 years, when I looked this up, I could only find three murders that have happened there. Really? Mm Mm-hmm. And when this accident happened, there hadn't been a murder for 11 years. The fire, which was contained in the garage, had been put out by the time the Major K Squad had gotten there. The fire department had warned the detectives that the temp was still about 200 degrees inside. Actually, it was so hot that the car tires had melted. 
They also told the detective that they guaranteed that he would never have seen anything like this. And later, the detective did claim that even after his years in Vietnam, it, he wasn't prepared for what he saw. In the middle of two cars was a charred body oh. of a nude woman oh. strapped in a rocking chair. Strapped? Let me get to it. <laughs> so, of course, at this time, with all the fire trucks, with all the police squads, all the neighbor looky-loos come out. And they want to see what's going on. And the police started asking them questions. One of the neighbors, her name was Mary, said that she had been fairly close to the deceased kind of a mother figure. Julie Miller Bullock was the victim. She was 31 years old. She was a young professional woman that worked at Southwestern Bell. Uh -huh. Now, Southwestern Bell mm -hmm. is AT&T now. Huge company back in the 80s, though. Huge company, and she worked downtown, the city. She'd been living in the house for 11 years. She had moved in with her parents when they became sick, and she continued living there after they had passed away. Julie had a younger brother named Robert, and they had already called him and notified him that there was a fire at the house and Julie was gone. Julie had gotten married in February to a Dennis Bullock, and they had met through a singles ad in a local newspaper. Mm. Remember those mm -hmm. before Tinder and That's why yeah, hmm. put your name in a uh, Do like Peter <laughs> exactly. getting caught in the rain. Dennis was employed at Price Waterhouse. He was currently out of town on business. And Mary also told them that Julie had been depressed lately. Oh. The police searched the house, and one officer came across a bottle of antidepressants. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, he surmised that Julie just must have taken the pills and set the garage on fire and just waited to die. And strapped herself in. But he hadn't looked too close to the body. Mm -hmm. The lieutenant near did. Mm. Lieutenant near thought that there was no way Julie could have committed suicide. The lower portion of Julie's head was wrapped in yards of duct tape. Oh. Her arms were taped to the armrests of the chair and neatly lined up rows. She also had tape neatly crisscrossing her chest that left her breasts exposed. Lieutenant Near noticed that all the tape had been put in nice little even rows. Actually, he described it that she was wrapped up like a birthday present or a Christmas present. The only tape that was sloppy was on the bottom of the chair, but he figured that must have burnt off because the fire had burned Julie's feet to the point where they really were no longer there. All the skin had been burned off, and it was pretty much just bones. That's such a nightmare. I can't even. And as he looked closer, he noticed that Julie had a blue tape wrapped around both wrists and elbows. Like electrical tape? just had a blue tape, a blue vinyl coating tape, so it sounds like electrical tape. So with all this tape and how it was nicely put on, there's no that. way no. she would have committed suicide. So the ME arrived, medical examiner, and of course with all the people out there, and the garage was very dark and still smoky, they had to bring Julie's body out so the medical examiner could just kind of look at it. And the police held up blankets and sheets to yeah. block everybody's view and pretty much we'll find out that that's the last amount of privacy julie ever oh. got with this whole uh, situation they did all that to block the spectators a view of the yeah. horrible oh that'd be that would be way she was you couldn't see that you couldn't unsee that so after julie's body was taken away lieutenant near searched the house in the master bedroom he found a pair of julie's jeans and underwear thrown in a heap on the floor on an unmade bed was a man's white shirt and suit pants with a plastic ID badge type thing attached to the belt. And on the TV was a sex toy on top of a roll of toilet paper. On the television? On the television. St. Louis County Police has a policy that any autopsies of questionable deaths must be performed the day the body is found. And Julie's was started shortly after 11 o'clock that morning. Dr. Gantner was a specialist in forensic pathology. In his 30 years of performing autopsy, he averaged about 10 fire-related deaths a year. That's about 300. My math skills aren't great, but it's about 300 deaths due that. to burning, right? That's a lot, isn't it? I would think so. That's, that's one of my biggest fears is to be burn. Because, you know, it, it takes it, a while. Well, it yeah. hurts until your nerves get damaged, and then it doesn't hurt anymore, but... 
until then, it's painful, extremely painful. Uh, so since he had so much experience, he would know if the fire had been set to cover up Julie's murder or if she had actually died in the fire. Before he could even begin, he and his assistants had to unwrap Julie's body from the chair. Untape it, I guess, take the tape off. Right. It had to cut her body. Mm -hmm. She had to be cut from the chair and then unwrap the tape from her body. They said basically she looked like a mummy in duct tape. That's how much duct tape was on there. So he thought, okay, normally if you die from carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide poisoning, mm -hmm. your skin turns pink. When he finally did get down to the skin, it wasn't pink at all. It was just the natural color. As he continued to examine the body, he found that the flesh had literally been cooked in the fire. It was charred and split open in places. Actually, they said she looked like a charred hot dog. Oh, how they split. How it splits oh, open. That's terrible. From her ankles down, it was just bone. Places on her body with high water content, like the earlobes and her areola, nipple Rust, area, yeah. they exploded. But thankfully, the internal organs were not damaged. There was no evidence of soot in her throat or lungs, and Julie had been dead before the fire had started. When they measured the tape, they found 47 feet of tape wrapped around her arms. Just her arms? Just her arms. 29 feet of white, one and a half inch tape, and three feet of blue vinyl coated tape on her right arm. 15 feet of white tape and three and a half feet of blue tape on her left arm. The tape that was crisscrossed on her chest was not measured, nor the scraps that were down by her feet. Why? They didn't say. That's weird. The lab assistants then tried to remove the 30 feet of tape that had been wrapped around her head from her chin to the bottom of her nose. They were gentle and cautious, but chunks of hair and pieces of skin were just being pulled off with the tape. No matter how hard they tried, it was just bad. Dr. Gartner didn't understand how a working woman would allow herself to be wrapped up like that and then have to go to work the next day. Because, you know, you wouldn't put duct tape in your hair. Remember, we went to school with a kid who got duct tape put in his hair, and then when they ripped it out, it did nerve damage, and he lost all of his hair, right? When the doctor pried open Julie's jaws, two pieces of white terry cloth material popped out of her mouth, and he deduced this was probably gags. And how, with what force they popped out of her mouth, he pretty much deduced that they had been forced into her mouth, which caused her tongue to go back into her throat, mm -hmm. which was restricted her airways and made breathing impossible. And in fact, he guessed that within eight minutes, she would have been, had irreversible brain damage and probably died of suffocation. But considering she was wrapped in 76 yards of tape and gagged, the doctor started to think that this was some kind of erotic fatality. Mm, I think there's too much tape for that. But No, well, you never know. Different strokes for different folks. There are very few erotic deaths with a partner mm -hmm. when you do bondage. Plus, the bondage in this case was more sadomasochistic. Mm -hmm. Over 76 feet of tape was used on a 5'2", 125-pound woman. Since the body was so badly burned, there were no signs of a struggle, like bruising or scratches, and any fingerprints that were on the skin or tape would have vanished. Another thing that bothered him was the gags. He deducted that the mouth would have been taped up last because once she started dying, her arms would not have swelled up like they did, and if her arms were free, she could have removed the gag. And once she started to choke, she would have made noises in which her partner would have heard. Mm -hmm. And he would have done Ideally, something about them. Ideally. Have. Dr. Gantner ruled Julie's death a homicide. I would concur. Mm -hmm. So the state fire marshal went back to check the scene at the garage, as they're apt to do. And he found a rag stuffed in the tailpipe of Julie's car. And it had been taped securely into place. Ugh. And there was also two cans of gasoline along the garage wall. Since there wasn't a break-in, the police knew that Julie would probably have known her killer, right? They started interviewing everyone in her address book and people that she worked with. 
everyone said the exact same thing about Julie, that she was quiet, she was shy, and she was a homebody. So there was a complete search of Julie's house. The police found in the trash an envelope addressed to Dennis, her husband, with a house survey, which uh, the survey is proof of how much the property there is and how big and what's in the property and, you know. Mm -hmm. What you have done before you get ready to sell, right? Right. Yeah. Right. And also a 1984 appraisal of jewelry, which totaled $44,000 back in 1985, which is over $100,000 now. There was a bottle of wine that was uncorked and almost emptied, along with a sealed bottle of fairly expensive champagne that was about $65 a mm, bottle of champagne. That's still a lot. That's more than you and I would pay for a bottle oh, of champagne. No. Mad dog, man. Just add the little Sprite. It's your own champagne oh, right ice. there. He's as good as can be. The major K squad had asked Julie's former housekeeper to go through the house with Lieutenant Near to see if maybe it was a robbery that went bad or to see if. No robber's going to put that much time invested into taping that little girl into a chair. Uh, you would think. Uh, the housekeeper pointed out that there were three sex manuals The Joy of Sex more joy of sex, and making love better. They weren't jewelries. Oh. Indeed, her husband's name had been written in the last one. Hmm. I guess he just wanted that back. In case he lent it out with somebody, he's going to want it back. Ew, Why would you put your you name in a book? that out, though? <laughs> well, would you put it. your name in it? Ew. Seriously. So the books explained how to safely perform sexual bondage. There were also two vibrators in the bedroom. And they were new, too, said the housekeeper. Not, not counting the one on the TV? Didn't say. Okay. They were new, too. The cop and the cleaning woman then went through the basement, and they saw on the clothesline was a white slip, like a, the negligee. 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 The kind that you wear actually under clothes, right? Mm -hmm. The housekeeper said, uh, yeah, this, is, this isn't Julie's because... It's too big. If Julie would wear it, it would go down to her knees or go down to her ankles. And when the lieutenant held up the slip, it would have fit his body, like six foot tall man. So the real puzzle for the detectives was what was the nude, bound and gagged body of Julie doing in her garage? I mean, there were rumors out there about wild orgy type clubs in West County, which would be so scandalous if that was ever found <laughs> out because West County's money, along with talk of roaming sex dungeon clubs that used heavy duty restraints and mm -hmm. SMM bondage. And they were just curious if Julie had ever been involved with something like that. Dennis Bullock, who had been in St. Paul, Minneapolis, on business with his company Pricewaterhouse, he'd been brought home. His boss had flew home with him and driven him straight to the police department. So he knew. He knew. The company had called his boss, and his boss had to break the news to him. So Dennis walked in wearing a dark suit, looked very put together, very in control. The situation. How old was just, he at this time? 31, 32. He just completely fell apart. He was not in control. It was all looks. So they brought Dennis into a room to record an interview with him and started asking him questions. And he started crying, and he started acting like a child. When told that his wife of 10 weeks may have been murdered, he'd started screaming and wailing at the top of his lungs. The whole thing lasted about 10 minutes before the officers stopped the tape recorder, saying, it's 4.39, interview went kaput. Oh. And Dennis put his head down and went to sleep. Huh? Mm -hmm. Right then and there. Right then and there, right at the police interview what? room. About an hour later, they took Dennis to the house to see if there, anything looked strange or out of place. Dennis noticed out of everything that the VCR had been unplugged. And he was concerned because he had set a timer for it to record the second part of a two-part series on Ted Bundy. And he had wanted to do that for Julie. Then he started saying that he had tried to get Julie not to talk to these people. And the police were like, what? It's like, I told her not to talk to these people. I told her. And Dennis said that Julie only used first names, so she really didn't, he really didn't know. So there was Jim the Army guy, and then Dennis started to cry. There was Mike and Eureka. Then there was the lawn guy, and Julie said that they were just friends. Women don't talk like that. And then he said in a way that implied that they might have been 
more than just friends. Mm -hmm. When asked if Julie could have let them in the house, she said, she told me that if I didn't want to stay home and take care of her, she knew somebody who would. Stay home and take care of her? She has a job. What does he mean? Mean sexually? Thank you, Camille. You're good. I'm a little slow sometimes. Okay, go ahead. Sometimes? When asked if these were boyfriends, Dennis replied, well, she said they were just friends. And then when they asked who Julie's closest friends were, he said that Julie never used last names. But he never really answered the question. And he did say if they found Julie's diaries, they would find out more information Mm -hmm. about the whole situation. Mm -hmm. And she did. She kept diaries and journals and Mm -hmm. wrote everything down. Then the police asked if Julie ever attempted suicide. Mm. And Dennis said, well, yeah, she did say something about pills and carbon monoxide poisoning. Dennis, of course, then immediately jumped to, is anything missing? And Dennis went on to great detail about all the jewelry his so wife said. I was just going to say, would that be the first thing out of your mouth? I don't, I don't care about it. I don't even that. think that would pop in my head. Not even care. But you know what? When people are under pressure, they think weird things. I know, but not that. I, I was think- in a car accident and I was stuck in my car and I had to crawl out of the window. And the only thing I thought of is, my God, I hope I don't rip my pantyhose because these were the last pair of pantyhose I had. Is that for real? For real. I was 19. Yeah, okay, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, so you never know what's going on, but still, I still don't think if they told me my husband was brutally Brutally. murdered, I wouldn't jump to what's stolen. Mm -hmm. Then Dennis explained that she, and it was noted that Dennis never once used his wife's name or said my wife. Always called her she. After 10 weeks of marriage. Wow. Mm -hmm. Dennis explained that she had all these life insurance policies and brought up their joint savings account and how much was in it and how much they each had put in it. And then when the detectives commented that Dennis knew a lot about insurance, Dennis got upset and snapped that he had been raised this way and he was raised to be security conscious. Mm -hmm. They don't have kids and they've been married 10 weeks. 10 weeks, yeah. But he knew every single financial figure. And that comes out that same The day after. Yeah. Mm-mm. Okay. Or the day of, I'm assuming. So when Dennis was asked about how he met his wife, he answered they met through mutual friends in September. Liar, liar. And then he asked how much longer this was all going to take because I was nauseous because I haven't eaten. No, he did not say that. Yeah, he did. So how much longer is this going to take? So anyway, they went on for the interview and the officers pretty much wanted to know about Julie and Dennis's sex life, mm-hmm. right? They asked about sex toys and all this kind of stuff. And Dennis said, I know she had some. She had a vibrator. She was kind of liberated. Damn liberated woman. Damn. And then the officer asked if he knew if she was a member of any clubs or anything. And he's like, not that I know of. Julie was a straight upper middle class girl. Because God knows Mm -hmm. if you have money, you can't be any kind Mm -hmm. of kinky, perverted Mm -hmm. person. Mm -hmm. So the first suspect that the police thought was maybe Dennis's first wife. He had been married before. A wife's not going to do that. That's not, they just shoot her with a gun. Yeah. She also worked for Southwestern Bell. Mm -hmm. And the motive might be jealousy. Well, Mm -mm. it wasn't. She was cleared. The second suspect was Julie's brother, Robert. He was subjected to hours upon hours of polygraph tests. And he failed. He kept failing. And finally, he passed. And then Lieutenant Nair began to look at Dennis. Finally. He found it odd that Dennis never once asked if Julie had suffered. So two days later, May 8th, Lieutenant Nair called Dennis's parents looking for him. Dennis needed to go identify Julie's body. They didn't know where he was. Nobody did. The next day? Two days later. Two days later. And he's May 8th. Like... Dennis is gone. Okay. Nobody knows where he is. So then they had to call Robert Jr., Julie's brother, to go identify the body. That's terrible. Not only did Robert have to go identify the body, when he called Dennis to talk about funeral arrangements, Dennis told him to do whatever he wanted. He didn't want to talk about it. Robert had to deal with everything. Once the house was released from the police, he had to get it boarded up. He had to get it fixed up. He had to... So Dennis didn't move back into that house. Dennis... I'm surprised. Disappeared. Robert had to plan the funeral and take care of everything, and he had to pay for everything, too. Unbelievable. Interesting enough, on the day of the funeral, police were searching the house, and they found a gray metal file box among Dennis's possessions. Inside 
were three colored photographs of nude women. Mm. One was of Dennis's first wife. Mm -hmm. The other two were of a young woman, like teenage young. Ugh. And one of the pictures, her ankles were bound together. With tape? Didn't say. It was with tape. Dennis failed to attend the wake on Friday or the funeral on Saturday. What the F is wrong with him? Well, lots. Mm -hmm. After Dennis failed to show up at Julie's wake and funeral, Dennis's boss, Jim, you know, the one that brought him back from mm -hmm. Minneapolis, mm -hmm. started thinking about what all happened up there. And after the service, he drove straight to the police mm -hmm. station to give a statement. I bet there was some time up there that old Dennis was unaccounted for. Well, his statement says, before 7 o'clock in the morning on May 6, a few hours after Julie Bullock's body had been discovered, Jim received a phone call in his hotel room. It was Dennis, and he said, I don't know what family you were with last night, but I was with you, okay? He told his boss to say that? Mm hmm Oh. Jim then asked, oh, I guess you had a long night. Dennis answered, well, yeah. Oh. And Jim... Assumed it was a girl. Just assumed that he had been with another woman. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then Jim, his boss, said he heard what sounded like traffic noises and a long-distance operator mm -hmm. and thought it was really weird since Dennis was staying at the same hotel that he was. Pricewaterhouse, the company both Jim and Dennis worked for, called Jim to let him know that Dennis' wife had passed and he was to tell Dennis Jim just assumed what they meant by wife was for Dennis's first wife. Mm -hmm. Dennis had just been divorced, so it would have been an easy mistake to say that, you mm -hmm. know, it's his wife. So Jim went to Dennis's motel room to tell him that his ex-wife was dead, and Dennis was in the shower. And before Jim could say a word about his wife, Dennis stepped out and said, Hey, did I ever tell you that I just got married? Oh, yep, that's what I thought. Mm -hmm. So on May 10th, they still hadn't found Dennis. Work hadn't seen him. His parents hadn't seen him. So he just quit going to work, too. He disappeared. He completely vanished. They started looking at old places that he would visit, and one of them included uh, his old house in University City where he and his ex-wife had. And he, they had sold this house about two weeks prior to all this happening. They talked to his neighbors, and the neighbors really hadn't seen him for a while, but they did say that... They had seen him come before the house sold, and he would stay long amounts of time overnight by himself. And then they did see him with some tall blonde over Thanksgiving and Easter, and she stayed there for a while. But when they showed the neighbors a picture of Julie, it wasn't Julie. They'd never well, had Julie seen was Julie. Short, petite. right? She was five two. They never saw Julie at all. They didn't even know that who the girl was. So, of course, the parents didn't know where he was, but they did know that Dennis had taken his mother's car. And they suggested that he may have driven to Springfield, Missouri, mm -hmm. to visit his sister's grave. His sister had died when they were both very young. So they put in an all-points bulletin for him. And in the book that I got most of this information from said that Dennis's therapist, who was a friend of a friend of Dennis, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm called that friend and said, you better lock your doors because I think he's going to hurt somebody. Ooh, the therapist said that? Mm -hmm, about Dennis. Oh. The police had a lot of circumstantial evidence against Dennis, but how could he have done it? I mean, he was in St. Paul with his boss mm -hmm. the whole time, and the boss saw him there in the morning, and people saw him at night, so how could he have gotten back and forth? They checked the records with the airlines, he wasn't registered for any flights. He could still drive, though. Yeah, but it would have been a lot. I mean, it's only, I think, eight hours. Not as far as you think. It would have been 16 hours round trip. There yes. wasn't enough time. Correct. So the investigators started to read all the evidence that was seized from the Bullock's house. Dennis, he kept track of everything. He had files, he had receipts, he had his bills, his engagement books. He had a little black book, letters. He kept everything. Mm -hmm. Totally didn't miss a beat. He had volumes and volumes of diaries, like he wrote everything down. Hmm. In his telephone and address books, mm -hmm. it was pretty much a treasure trove of his social climbing in St. Louis. He was a social climber. There were 53 single women of varying backgrounds. Most were very rich, judging by the addresses, because he wrote that. He wrote the address down Yeah. There. A few lived on the East Coast. 
And the police thought, you know what, for a man, for a wife who left him in May of 85 Mm -hmm. and walked out of divorce court in December of 85, then walked back down the aisle in February 86, he amassed more than 52 names of women in this black book in nine months. Hmm. So he was kind of a hoa. Now, or social climber. Were these his targets, though? Like, was he? He was a social climber. He wanted to be wealthy, and he was going to make a name for himself. Okay. So next to the social names, Dennis had written in what parties, charity balls, or trendy restaurants he and this woman had been introduced at. Does it give names? Because I would like to hear some of those. It does give names, but all the names in this book had been changed to protect the innocent. (gasps) But I did find out one. Um, For example, a flawless blonde who belonged to Old Warson Country Club, money, 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 Uh was entered in his little black book with a notation that they had met at Bush's Bar after a museum opening. So it also had the names of the acquaintances that they had in common. And the larger the trust fund, the more prominent their names. Uh The more these women found... When later interviewed, they just thought Dennis was the perfect gentleman. So depending on how high you were at the social scene was how much Dennis turned on the charm. Mm -hmm. Dennis, now he was equal opportunity. He also jotted down prominent men that he had met and um, how he met them. Like he met one son of a former mayor Mm -hmm. of St. Louis Mm -hmm. through a social organization, Mm -hmm. a fancy zoo-type organization, maybe. One of the police officers commented that that his book was basically a who's who in St. Louis Mm -hmm. and of the U.S. The most impressive name in Dennis's little black book was a woman the book named Rebecca Becky Peabody Cabot. I love that name. Now, her family had founded a few generations back and a billion-dollar-a-year national industry based in St. Louis. And this was in 19, as of 1991, mm-hmm. where the book was published. One of her relatives was named one of Fortune magazine's 400th wealthiest Americans. And they said the Peabody Cabots could have lavishly lived from their interest. Alone. Alone. By this info, I'm guessing it's a relative of the Bush family from Anheuser-Busch. And remember, not all Bush relatives have the last name of Bush. Mm -hmm. Right now, I think there's 30 members of the Bush family that are still alive, and they have, there's at least four different family names there. Mm -hmm. And I figured this out because the Forbes 400 Wealthiest People started in 1982, Mm -hmm. and this was 1985 when this happened. Augustus Bush III, Mm Augie, no, Gussie, it was Gussie Bush. He was the only St. Louisan listed in 82 and 85. And those were the only two lists I could find. Oh, then that's what it is. Mm -hmm. But as of 2016, the Bush family is worth about $13.5 billion. Oh, is that it? But they have to pass it out with 30 members. Poor things. Dang it. In St. Louis, the very rich often live like upper middle class. And they try to keep blend in with the middle class of the city. Pretty much their motto is money flashed is money vulgar. I totally subscribe to that. I live like I don't have money. I live like that, too. Yeah. It's, it's almost it's, as if I don't It's have almost money. like we don't have money. I know. It is. We're that, we're that good. We are that good. We are that good. So basically, the Peabody Cabot name was a household word for power, pretty much, right? Mm-hmm. Or maybe the Bush's name. So to have this name as... One of Dennis's friends would impress Dennis's superiors at his job at Pricewaterhouse, Mm -hmm. the accounting firm. And they had already thought that he was very conscious of making social contacts around town. They Mm -hmm. thought he was very good at that, Mm -hmm. and he was known for it. So in his daytimer, Dennis noted everything. He wrote down when he went to bed, what time he woke up. That's weird. That's almost like an obsession. Yeah. Who does that? Whether he got much out of his therapy sessions and sometimes he went to two therapists one after each other one therapist on tuesday and then one on a different one. thursday yeah that's weird i know he wrote down the anniversary of every couple he had ever met he wrote down every upcoming party at his tennis club and all the tennis dates that he had 
He even wrote down the date of his first wife leaving him. In 1986, he listed her birthday and the anniversary of his first date on June 10th with his girlfriend, Jody. He even wrote down a reminder that when he goes to Chicago in the next month to go to the Land's End outlet to hmm. pick up some stuff. These are things that seems like you wouldn't forget, but okay. Did you know what was not in the daytimer? Him meeting Julie and marrying her. Mm -hmm. You know, like a major Julie's birthday in wasn't in there. Julie's really? the wedding wasn't written down anything. Nothing. Julie was never mentioned in this daytimer. Ever. And yet he put when he went to bed. Okay. Mm -hmm. Not weird at all. So while the police were looking at Dennis, they were talking to past lovers of Julie. They wanted to get down to this nitty gritty sexual escapades. Who Pro was doing what, right? Mm -hmm. They wanted to figure out if she had a kinky side, basically. Julie had only been with few men, and they all confirmed that Julie was no sexual deviant. She didn't wear red silk teddies or thigh-high heeled boots. She lip. was the white cotton panty kind of girl. Mm. She was very prim and proper, very conservative, very good girl. And the book actually made a comment of uh, she would keep a missionary very pleased. Missionary position. I got gotcha. Yeah. And actually, by looking at a photo that the police had of Julie, it was one of her last pictures taken, mm -hmm. you could tell what a good girl she was. Mm -hmm. That's what they say about me. See, for a wedding gift, her brother Robert and his wife gave Julie and Dennis a bottle of champagne, expensive champagne, oh. from their honeymoon that they took in Europe, and a gift certificate to a photographer to either get engagement photos or get wedding photos taken. Mm -hmm. So after Julie had been murdered, mm -hmm. Robert gets a phone call from the photographer asked to pick up the photos. Mm -hmm. So he goes to pick it up. The pictures were of Julie, just in a regular blouse, very little makeup. You know, this mm -hmm. engagement, wedding, no fancy gown, no fancy dress, mm -hmm. just Julie. Dennis was not in any of the photos. He didn't even go. So the day after the murder... Police discovered cassette tape that Julie had recorded about a month before her death. Mm -hmm. And for 50 minutes, Julie cries and begs Dennis to love her and to pay attention to her. One investigator even stated that it was pretty much the low point of the investigation for mm -hmm. everybody, that they had to listen to it. And it said that except for child abuse cases, Julie was the most pitiful and pathetic victim that the investigators had ever heard. What's that mean? Clarify. Because she, for 50 minutes, she was on that tape going, just love me. I just want you to love me, Dennis. Ew. She, like, cried and was begging him to love her. Huh. Okay. So Friday morning on May 9th, after the APB was put out, a bricklayer had called the police department saying that he noticed that there was an abandoned car parked near the Mississippi River. Mm -hmm. And he gave him the details, and sure enough, it sounded like Dennis's mom's gotcha. car. So the police went out there, and it was registered out to Jenny Bullock. And inside, on the dashboard, were two manila envelopes. Carefully opening them, they found inside a will and testament addressed to a very prominent attorney in a high-priced law firm here in St. Louis, a three-page note to Dennis's family, a six-page letter, a one-page list of household goods with a photocopy of everything, an engagement book, and his resume. Okay. So on yellow legal paper, Dennis wrote a list of who would inherit what from his estate. He's setting it up to make it look like he's killing himself, I guess. Dennis had left all his worldly goods to his loving parents, and he put it in a trust except for $15,000. That was earmarked to go to the twins of one of his best friends. Strangely, he left all the household furnishings of Julie's house, including crystal, the china, the silverware. That was Julie's house? Mm -hmm. Or the house they shared? That was Julie's house that she had lived with with her parents. He moved in with her after they got married because he had just sold his house in University mm -hmm. City, right? And all this totaled almost $20,000. He left it all to his first wife's little sister. The first wife's still alive, though, right? Mm-hmm. 
So instead of inheriting his mother's and great aunt's pieces of furniture or anything, really, Julie's brother Robert had been left some den furniture. That's it. Hmm. Dennis's girlfriend, Jody, was to receive everything in the family room and kitchen, which was worth more than anything Robert got. And per Julie's request, Dennis had said that he wanted her estate jewelry, which appraised in 1983 uh, for more than $44,000, to go to Robert's wife. But Dennis had given the jewelry to his parents. And as far as I know, Robert has never gotten that family jewelry back. Dennis also left in his mother's car a suicide note. He's too chicken. He'd never kill himself. Carefully numbered pages. One of six, two of six. Of course. Six pages, right? Six pages, because who needs to hear from him? And it was dated May 8th. Statistical sociopath that thinks the world owes him. And oh my God. Okay, go ahead. So it went on to discuss all of his woes. Woe is me. Poor Dennis. Dennis accused the detectives of emotional police brutality. Mm. Brutality. Which, Look at mm-hmm. Julie. Hmm. which had just pushed him over the edge. The note was filled with self pity. Dennis blamed everyone but himself mm-hmm. for everything mm-hmm. that happened. Narcissistic. He went on into graphic detail about how perverted Julie had been, and he whined over and over. So they knew each other. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And he whined over and over and over that his life was just ruined because of it. So, in huge letters, he wrote. Mom and Dad and Graham, I love you very much, but this last loss, I just can't go on with it. Please forgive me. Please ask that Jeff pick out my clothes. And I hope God forgives me for all the stress I have put you through. I'm taking my final baptism. God help me. Almost brings a tear to my eye, except it doesn't. He also asked that when they do search the river for his body, don't use the hooks. He doesn't want the hooks messing up his body. Mm. Not to mention that his body's not in the river because he's a chicken. (laughs) So to the very end, he was worried about his appearance. That's it. Nothing else about Julie. Okay, so that was the murder and that's all the setup. So let's go back and delve into Julie and Dennis's past, shall we? Let's. Julie Alice Miller Bullock was born in St. Louis on July 7th, 1954, to Blanche and Robert Miller Sr. Her brother, Robert Jr., was born four years later. Now, Julie's father, Robert Miller Sr., was an Air Force captain during World War II. He was a widower and had moved from Ohio to St. Louis as a buyer for Famous Bar, mm-hmm. or May Company, which I don't think any of them are still in business anymore, are they? Famous Bar became Macy's, yeah. Yeah, but May Company sold to Macy's, didn't it? Yeah. Something like that. So he was 52 years old when he married Blanche Mm. in a small ceremony in Clayton. And Blanche was 33. Mm. Seven months later, on July 7th, 1954, Julie was born. Wait, seven months after their wedding? Yep. Seven months. Yep. Mm. Okay. Basically, what is said was Blanche loved the attention that he gave her and she loved the idea of getting married. Sounds right. (laughs) <laughs> and so she married this much older man and to prove that things still worked she got pregnant before she got married he was a dad though right yes he was a oh, father okay okay Whew. she wanted to prove that things worked or something to that effect i should say even though there was a 20 year age difference robert senior and blanche had very had a very strong marriage well at least at first blanche was very outgoing and very social, and Robert loved that at first. Robert Sr. loved it at first. But as he became older, he just didn't have the energy to keep up with his wife, Mm -hmm. much less his children. Julie was this little blonde-haired, blue-eyed girl that was easy to please, and she wanted nothing more but her father's love and Mm -hmm. approval. But he would come home from work, and Julie would want to cuddle up on his lap and have him read to her, and he was just exhausted. I mean, he's almost... 60 at this point and Mm. his work just pretty much exhausted him and he just couldn't keep up with his kids instead of making an effort to at least try he just kind of withdrew from his family Mm -hmm. let them go do their thing and he just came more into himself and of course julie thought that he didn't love her Mm -hmm. because he wouldn't show her any kind Mm -hmm. of 
attention, but she was wrong. He loved her very much. And in fact, she took his coldness as that it was her fault. And so the only way to really get into his heart is she just had to be the best girl that she could possibly be. And that would get him Mm -hmm. to love her. And also a lifetime of daddy issues. Exactly. So when Julie was 13, the family moved to New Jersey. And normally this would cause a lot of drama for a 13-year-old girl. She was leaving her friends, changing schools, moving halfway across the country, but Julie never raised a fuss. She was a perfect kid. She kept her room clean. She made excellent grades. She actually graduated at the top 10% of her class, and she graduated in 1972. And this is kind of heartbreaking, but the caption Mm -hmm. of her senior yearbook picture Mm -hmm. said, a very simple book with very large print and very easy to read. So not only did Julie have to act perfect, she had to look perfect. Her clothes were always neat. Her hair always looked nice. She wasn't like those dirty hippies back in the 70s, Hmm. you know. Um, She didn't do drugs. She didn't drink alcohol. And even though she had a steady boyfriend, no sex. And actually, she didn't really love him. She just, he was somebody to go out with and Mm -hmm. Hang hang out with and have fun with. She also liked to sew and she became a seamstress. She made all of her own clothes, her own outfits. She even sewed her own bedspread and curtains. Mm. And she liked sewing so much, she be, got a part-time job at a fabric store just to make extra money to spend on fabric, basically. Julie's best friend in high school said that they would always discuss their future, like who they would marry and how many kids. And Julie would always talk about finding the perfect man and having the perfect job and everything, but she never went into details. Mm. It was just, he's going to be perfect. Well, how perfect? I don't know, just perfect. So, but as distant as Julie was with her father... She was extremely close to her mother. Um, Some even said that they were too close. Like if anything would ever go wrong, Julie would run to her mother and her mother would instantly fix it. Mm -hmm. It's kind of good and kind of bad. You know, you can't fix all your kids' problems, even though you want to. So now for college, Julie, after she graduated, Julie went to college. She commuted to a liberal arts college. And while most of her classmates went away to school, she was still living at home. She was making excellent grades, but after a few months, she just dropped out, didn't want to do it anymore. She got a job at Prudential Insurance Company, where she handled, thank you, she was handling all the medical claims there. So let's jump to 1972. Julie and her family moved back to St. Louis, which she really didn't want to do, but family kind of talked her into it. And her family moved into the house in Baldwin, which she was later found murdered in. But Julie at the time got her own apartment. And while most 19-year-olds would have been really excited about being on their own and having... You can't tell me what to do. Julie was really lonely. And before she could really start to get acclimated to where she wasn't lonely and just kind of acclimated to being on her own, her parents' health started to decline. Robert Sr. started to have strokes and Blanche had breast cancer and had to undergo a mastectomy. And I can't even imagine what a mastectomy would have been in 1973. So at 19, while all of Julie's friends were dating, falling in love, getting married, having kids, being successful in careers, Julie moved into her parents' home to take care of her sick parents Mm. and her 15-year-old brother. She became the head of the household, and her brother later said that Julie never had time to be selfish, and her emotional and sexual development were hacked off in midstream. She just kept falling further and further behind socially, which is understandable. Mm -hmm. So after four years of strokes, Robert Sr. passed away from pneumonia, and Blanche was going through rigorous amounts of chemo and radiation treatments, which was not only hard for Blanche, it was really hard for Julie emotionally. Mm -hmm. It took its toll on her. But in 1990, Julie got a promotion to a management position at Southwestern Bell, and which meant that uh, she wouldn't work at the little offices like in the county anymore. She would actually go downtown to the huge corporate offices in the city. Julie also had to go to a training seminar to learn the management, and she went with one of her close friends from her job. Her friend, the book said Nora. I'm sure that's not her real name, but I'll Let's go with call Nora. Her Jen. <laughs> Jen? No, because Jen and Julie can't do that. So while they were away at the seminar, Julie got a call from her mother's doctor saying that her mother's cancer had metastasized and the prognosis wasn't good. And at this point, 
Julie just became inconsolable. It was so bad that her friend Nora said that Julie couldn't function. She couldn't cope. She couldn't, her, Nora had to pack her bags up and she couldn't even stay for the entire seminar. She had to go home. Mm -hmm. She just couldn't function. So by this point, Julie became the ultimate daughter and nurse to her mother. She would know every wish her mother had before her mother even knew she had it. When her mother lost weight, she would take in her mother's clothes. She doted on her mother. Julie would take care of all the medical bills and she would fill out all the insurance forms. She became the parent, basically. Mm -hmm. When friends would ask if she would want to go out to go shopping or go get a drink or go to the movies or even try to sit her up on dates, she wouldn't go. Mm -hmm. She wanted to be with her mother. She would not leave her side. So in 1983, a few weeks after Julie turned 29, Blanche Miller passed away. Julie was with her. When she took her, her very whole 20s were taking care of her mom then. And dad, yeah, mm. and her brother. I mean, oh, her yeah. brother and soon her went brother to college. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, she was paying the medical. She was the head of the household. Yeah. She took care of everything. So Julie was in the room when their pe- mother passed away, and that was like meant everything to Julie that she was there. So being Julie, she wanted her mother's funeral to be absolutely perfect. Julie's friends that came to the funeral, were really worried about her because she was extremely calm and very composed. She did not cry. She was perfectly Mm -hmm. quaffed. And Julie even told her friends that mommy would have wanted me to look this way. She would have expected me to handle this properly. That night when they got home from the funeral, Julie drug her brother outside and said, just look at this. Just come outside and look at this. And the shrubbery outside had those bagworms. She made them that night go out and pull off all the bagworms of all the shrubs because things must be nice no matter what or how it had to be done. Mm -hmm. They're going to do it now. That's just how she was. So after her mother's death, Julie totally threw herself into his job. She didn't have anything left anymore. Her entire time she spent taking care of her parents. Part of her adult life had just been taking care of her parents. Exactly. For 10 years. She was 19 when it started. So she threw herself in her job. And by 85, Julie was bringing in about $40,000 a year, which is huge. I mean, that's about $95,000 today. I mean... Yeah, it's good. Yeah, I would think so. And the only friends Julie really had were the people that she worked with. In fact, Nora, the one friend, said that Julie had once told her that if she ever got married, if Julie got married, she wanted Nora to be her maid of honor. And Nora said, that's when I realized that Julie never socialized outside of work. Mm Mm-hmm. So since Robert Jr. had married and moved out of the house, Julie would come home from work to her animals. She had a cat and a dog, and that's it. She would go to work, she'd come home. She'd go to work, she'd come home. And since her mother had died, Julie just was lost. And she spent so many years taking care of others, she didn't know how to take care of herself. Not only she didn't know how to take care of herself, but she didn't know how to stand up for herself either. She, her boss at work would belittle her mm-hmm. and make her cry. And one of the people that she carpooled with said that as much fun as she was, as effervescent as she was, she was very lonely, very timid, and very easily led. Julie, at heart, was a good little girl who always did what people would expect or want her to do. Anybody with a strong personality could sway her. Her personality was dictated by what others wanted her to be. Mm -hmm. She pretty much turned into this girl who used to dye her hair and basically be the smart little businesswoman, you know, blonde up her hair. She kind of quit doing all that. And she just came this mousy little girl who just tried to smile. Oh, that's sad. But the one thing Julie always thought was she would be happy. This whole thing could change and she could be happy if she could just find the right man to marry. That was coming. Isn't that oh. break your heart? Yes. Marrying a man or finding a man will not make you happy, no matter what. If you have problems before, you're going to have problems after. They're going to actually intensify. You have to make yourself happy before you can make, before anybody can make you happy. Uh, mm -hmm. Women, I'm telling you. So her neighbor, Mary, that the police talked to at the very beginning, Mm -hmm. remember? Mary suggested that she tried to meet some men through church Mm -hmm. or other community activities, Mm -hmm. but Julie was too shy and she couldn't handle strange groups. Mm -hmm. I mean, she had been in a relationship, but it had been more off than on. And that had been going on for years, but nothing ever really came about it. 
And this man was actually not even, she didn't even consider this man to be marriage material. Hmm. Sometimes she dated male colleagues who were married themselves. Oh. Hmm. And part of that may have been her lack of social skills. Mm -hmm. She didn't know how to deal with anything else. And it could be her way of rebelling. And actually one of the ladies in the carpool thought that it would no longer make her a good little girl if she dated married men, mm -hmm. you know, branching mm -hmm. out. Nora also said that the single men that she dated weren't great choices either, that she wasn't discriminating enough, and she just lured creeps, that even to please Julie, she just they just had to look good on paper. Mm -hmm. Julie wanted a professional, nice-looking man who earned a decent income. She loved anyone in a suit. And the worst part is, you know, Julie was always scared that people would be after her money. Although she wasn't technically, she was upper middle class, but she wasn't wealthy. She was so worried about people coming after her for her money that she would almost lure people in using her money. money. Wow. Like she dated this one guy for two weeks and it was his birthday came up. She spent over $300 or on <laughs> golf clothes for this guy. Wow. So that's. Yeah, no. Yeah, you don't do that. And she wanted love so much that she fell in love very easily. Mm -hmm. This one time she was having her house renovated. She slept with a landscaper, oh. had him to dinner and ended up sleeping together. And oh. she actually... Little good girl gone bad. She wrote it down oh. in her diary that it was like... And the way she described it was almost like this magical fairy tale story type. He did her bushes. Love, exactly. Really did her bushes. Mm -hmm. But of course... It was a one-night stand, and he didn't want anything to do with her afterwards. And he was newly divorced, and he had a business to run, and he didn't want any kind of relationship. She would say, but we had a relationship. We slept together. And she would show up un unannounced at his office, and she would call him all the time. And finally, this guy just started to tell his employees that he wasn't there, to tell her that he wasn't there. Oh, that's kind of sad. And this became a reoccurring thing in Julie's life. And each time it would happen, she'd fall deeper and deeper and deeper into a depression. And she became so depressed that she started to see one of those counselors that can be supplied by your business. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, they have like an on-site yeah. on health professional. Well, she started seeing them and it got so bad that he actually sent her to a psychiatrist. Mm. So she started to see a psychiatrist. Julie was so determined that all she would have to do to be happy was to find Mr. Wright that she wrote a personal ad in the Riverfront Times. Now, for those that don't know, the Riverfront Times is a progressive, this is what they say, mm -hmm. is a progressive weekly newspaper in St. Louis. It covers local politics, music, arts, and dining news. And back then in the 80s, I don't know if they have it now, but they also had an eligible section mm -hmm. the in they, the back. They always did the ads in the back. Right. That you can miss connections. Men like looking for women, women looking for men. Men looking for men, women yep. looking for... Yeah. So all sorts of personal ads, all sorts of missed connections, everything that you would ever... It was always fun to read. God, I love the Riverfront Times. She put an ad in, a personal ad, and this is what the ad said. Are you a really nice guy? <laughs> Sorry. If yes, this nice girl wants you to read on. I'm single, white, and female. 31 years old, 5'2", 125 pounds, whose appearance is pleasing to the eyes. My 9-to-5 life is professional. Other time is combined creative and suburban homebody. I've realized life without a boyfriend isn't that much fun. You are the type of man who's emotionally mature, likes himself, but not egotistical. <laughs> and wants a girlfriend, hopefully you're 29 to 36 years old, 5'9 or over. Weight proportionate, and looks that are easy on the eyes, and no children from previous marriage. Send brief letter and phone number. Let's meet for coffee, and something really nice could happen for both of us. Now, Julie was pretty happy because she had a lot of men answering her ad. But the one that impressed her most was from a man with an MBA. A very promising career as a senior management consultant at Pricewaterhouse and a house in a respectable suburb. He was a member of the Young Republicans and a friend of the art museum and zoo. And he belonged to the Classical Guitar Society. He was 32, 
getting a divorce and had no children. Best of all, he was movie star handsome, and his name was Dennis Neil Bullock. Ugh. So before Julie met Dennis, she did some research. She, as much as you could without internet, she went to her work and she hacked into the system and she put in her, his phone number and found out that he paid his bills on time. Mm. And she also had a friend that worked at Pricewaterhouse and confirmed that Dennis did, in fact, work there. So it all checked out. So on August 14th, 1985, Dennis and Julie meet for lunch. So we will find out about Dennis and what happened next tomorrow, hopefully tomorrow. You know what I'm still bugged about? The tape? Yes, Mm -hmm. the tape. Why so much? I don't know. That little bitty thing. A duct tape is so strong, you could not even. Not a little bit. One little strap, you wouldn't be able to. No. Anyway. All right. Stay tuned for tomorrow. Thanks, Jen. Can't wait to hear what happens. That horrid. Horrid man. Horrid man. Yes. So remember, lock your doors. And keep passing by those open windows. Uh, Bye-bye. Love ya. The officer asked a lot about jewelry, or not jewelry. <laughs> jewelry. 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 I love me some shiny things. Are you kicking the dog? Like, what is the noise down there? No, it's my feet itch. <laughs> okay, because I was like, what are you doing? Because I can hear that. Like, I Sorry. can hear it over here through, you know. Oh, here, let me put my shoes back on. Well, Dennis probably did like penis, penis coladas. <laughs> Probably not. That'd probably get me sued. I don't think he liked penis coladas, but I'm not one to judge, so I don't know. And he's still alive. And he's still alive and lives fairly close to us. <laughs> yes, he does. <laughs> so anyway, okay. So. She. <laughs> Sorry. Penis coladas. Okay, go ahead. Oh, right all right. Here. I get it quiet. Okay. Go ahead. All right. So, okay. Sorry, Nico. You got some bloopers now. All right. So. And he is currently in Minneapolis. Minneapolis. Mini. Mini Minneapolis. The Mini Minneapolis. The tape that crisscrossed across her tat. (laughs) Crisscrossed across. (laughs) Did you see that thread on Twitter about? It was pretty. It was kind of funny because it was like, okay, you guys are going to think I'm a bitch, but what are the things that you cannot stand when you're listening to a podcast? And it's a thread. Oh. And so, like, it goes on, you know. Oh, yeah. Like gum smacking, dog chewing. I mean, dog barking, kids crying. Um, All that crap that's everything horrible. That always happens. But then also the... Uh, it, Mispronunciations. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And then it's they, Minneapolis. Yeah. So, but I like to add the extra. It I makes like, me special. I like it. it Minneapolis. Like, they were saying pitcher. Oh, that like drives me crazy. Pitcher. My husband does that. There's two podcasts that say that all the time. And, yeah. So I was like, hmm, wonder who it is. Judy had only been with a few men. Not very many men Judy. at all. Judy. Judy Lee. <laughs> Judy had only been with very few. With a. Bleh. You said Judy. I know. <laughs> oh, I know I did. <laughs> Can I chew the ice? Mm-mm, nope. Okay. I don't even have any. Look. <laughs>